slide with introduction of interviewer and interviewee. Hello everyone! Welcome to episode number 21 of the It's My Job podcast. This is Jose. I am a transition student from Colorado. And my teacher, Miss Christine Dully, is the podcast facilitator. The It's My Job podcast features students interviewing adults who are blind or visually impaired, investigating important questions like how they use technology and how they connect with other people. Each of our interviews were designed by students for students. Stay tuned after the podcast to learn how to get involved. And please share with your friends and teachers so they can listen too. Now for the interview. I am interviewing Gary. He is a British journalist currently working in Washington, D.C. as their chief of North America political correspondent for BBC News. Now, let's listen to my interview with Gary. New slide with Gary's picture. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Gary O'Donoghue. I am 53 years old. I'm totally blind and I've been totally blind since I was eight years old. I was born with a little sight in one eye, not not terribly much, but some useful sight and that got worse and worse and eventually went when I was eight. I'm British. I'm from the UK. I work as a journalist. I work for the BBC, which is the British Broadcasting Corporation. And my job title is Washington correspondent for the BBC. I have a partner called Sarah, who's also a journalist. uh, And I have a daughter who's 19 called Lucy, who is studying international relations at York University uh, in England. What encouraged you to become a reporter? That's a good question. I mean, one of the things about being a reporter and being a journalist is that you spend a lot of time talking to people. You spend a lot of time asking questions, finding out about people, finding out about facts. And I always thought it was one of those things that was kind of well suited to to blind people in some ways. I mean, when I started my career, we did all our interviewing on the phone. We talked, we rang people up, we talked to them. We tried to find out stuff. We tried to you know, work out what was going on. Uh, a lot of it was done through oral communication. And that seemed to me to be pretty suited to to a blind person. I suppose also it's a kind of about your personality as well. I'm curious about the world. I'm curious about other people. Uh, nosy, you might call that. I think we'd call that in English sometimes. Nosy about other people. Uh, and so it, it was something I kind of naturally fell into. And, and I enjoyed the broadcasting side of it in particular. I like the journalistic side of it. Uh, and I've also, I mean, in recent years, I do much more television than I do radio, but I've enjoyed that too. And I've enjoyed showing, I suppose, showing people that blind people can do television, that you can be a successful television reporter, even if you're totally blind. And there was a time where people thought that was impossible. I mean, they really did. They were There were plenty of people that, dis- that were around to discourage me when I was trying to get into the business. And I didn't listen to them. I didn't take no for an answer. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's been all plain sailing, but it's, you know, I've managed to get somewhere along the way uh, with a lot of hard work and um, actually a lot of enjoyment and meeting a lot of nice people along the way too. What kind of education do you have to perform your job? Well, that's a very good question because I've had no formal journalistic uh, training or schooling at all. That's quite, un- I mean, that's very unusual nowadays. I think a lot of people go to journalism school, particularly in the United States, but they do in, in Europe increasingly now as well and do media or journalism or broadcast journalism or a mixture of that and other things. My actual, uh, what you might call my college education, what we call in, in England or in, in the UK, university education, I studied philosophy and French, philosophy and modern languages, so nothing to do with journalism whatsoever. And I enjoyed every minute of that time. In terms of my, my school, when I went to uh, school, like uh, high school. I went to a special school uh, for blind kids in the UK. Uh, It was called Worcester College for the Blind at the time. It's changed its name now to New College Worcester. Uh, It was a a school you had to do an exam to get into when you were 11 years old. It was very, very academically minded. It was, and we, you know, we were, we learned Latin and uh, did lots of sort of academic subjects, all that kind of thing. And uh, they were very much focused on getting blind people, blind children into university, getting them into college. It was, a, a great education I was very privileged and in many ways because I you know because it's an irony but because I lost my sight when I was eight I ended up actually getting a lot better education than my brothers did who could see who went to the local schools where where my parents lived it's it's one of those strange kind of twists of fate that actually losing my sight ended up me ended up with a much better chance in life in a funny way thank you good 
What is the most difficult task in the reporter job, being a blind reporter? That's a super question. That's a really, really good question. A very, a really intelligent question, I must say. Um, <clears throat> I think the most difficult side of it always is what you might call access to information, be that written information, be that sort of visual information. The world is such a kind of busy place at the moment, you know, trying to keep track of what's happening on all the different social media platforms, trying to read everything. I mean, we have much better access to to stuff now through our, you know, through voiceover on our phones or JAWS or MVDA on our PCs or voiceover on the Mac. We can get to stuff, but we still, as blind people, we still have to kind of process it in a kind of linear bit by bit way. We can't, we can do, you know, use some tools to do a little bit of skimming, but skimming is quite hard when you can't see and, and sifting the sheer quantity of information as a, as a blind reporter is quite hard. So I, I try to be a bit smarter about it than that. I, I try to remember the places that are going to get me up to speed quickly. I don't just, you know, I, I have a list of people in the New York Times, for example, I will always read because I know I'll learn something and I don't just read the whole thing and, and you know, just because uh, half of it will not really increase my understanding of anything. So I follow particular people that I make sure I read every week. I follow particular magazines that I read that things like, uh, I mean, for current affairs, I read like The Economist every week. And that's a, a real sort of, you know, it's not fun. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's fun, but it's like, it's like homework, you know, it's like schoolwork. But, um, but you know, you kind of, for, for the amount of time you put in, you learn an awful lot. So I try and focus uh, my my way through the kind of the, the forest of information out there. And I think that's the hardest thing. The other hard thing, of course, is other people's expectations and their and their views about blindness. I mean, you know, we can't get around the fact that, you know, the, the world is quite frightened of blindness. I mean, most people are really, really frightened of going blind, um, if you ask them. And they sometimes transfer some of that anxiety onto us as blind people. And, you know, some of the time we can help them, help reassure them. But we've also got to get our own thing done, right? We're not there as social workers for the rest of the world. Um, and we've got to get our own things done. So navigating that is also a tricky and difficult business. And But I think that we're actually well placed as, as blind people to do that, because by just by sheer the sheer nature of being blind, we've had to do a lot more thinking than some other people do mm -hmm. about who we are, what, what impact we have on the world, how to get around things, problem solving, resilience. I'm sure your, your teachers have talked to you about resilience, incredibly important skills. And, and it's, it's kind of forced upon us as blind people because that's how we cope with the world. The tasks are very difficult, right? Also scheming, like we mentioned before. Yes. A very difficult task to accomplish. Yeah, it is hard. It's hard work, there's no doubt. What was your most favorite part and or your least favorite part about our presidential elections from last year? <laughs> well, I think the least favorite part was not being able to travel as much because of the COVID pandemic, because I was here for the 2016 election. and I was traveling all the time, seeing every different corner of these United States, seeing places that you know many Americans never see and getting all over and meeting people. And that was just super. And that was that was my least favorite part of this past election, that we really just didn't do much travel. We all did it really here from Washington. We, you know, we traveled right at the end, but really not much during the campaign at all and it's really hard to get a sense as a reporter of the country when you're not out there actually mixing with people in, in the way that uh, you'd like to to find out what's going on um what's my uh, favorite part of the election i mean i love elections right i don't care where they are whether they're in britain whether they're in the u.s whether they're anywhere i love elections and election nights Wherever they are, I find absolutely exciting. I'm a bit of a you know political junkie like that. So election night, I was at the White House standing on what they call Pebble Beach, which is where all the reporters do their live stand up as from standing there from about six in the evening through till about four in the morning, watching the whole thing unfold, doing some live contributions for my you know BBC net, uh, TV network from there, talking about what's happening in the West Wing and that. So you, it doesn't get any better than that. It's totally exciting. Sounds fun. <laughs> Sure is. What kind of accommodations does your employer provide to you at this moment and in previous jobs? It's a mixture. I mean, I I rely heavily on Braille. So I have a Braille display. I have a Focus 40 Braille display, which I'm sure you've seen, one of the, the premium scientific ones. I I don't know how I'd do my job without that because when I'm, particularly when I'm on the road and I've got to read a script, read it live, write something and then read it out over the radio, I have to be able to read Braille. I can't, 
there are some people around the world that can listen to, to Jaws in their ear and speak back, but I can't do that fluently enough. And, and I, I don't think I could ever do that. So I need to be able to read Braille. So that's one thing they do. Of course, I have a screen reader on my computer as well. I have a producer who works with me who's sighted, but then the other correspondents who are sighted, they have a producer too. So that's not a particularly special uh, accommodation. Everyone else has that too. Um, apart from that, there's not really very much. My employer pays for an IRA subscription for me, the, the $99 IRA subscription. They pay for that for me. So I have some independent sort of, you know, on the road access to to, uh, to some help when I, when I need that. But yeah, apart from that, there's not really much else they do that I can tell. I mean, one of the things I've always, I found, you know, sort of during my time uh, as a reporter, wherever I've been, is that, you know, we're in some ways we have to end up being our own uh, technical support, if I can say that. I don't think I'm particularly techie minded, but I've, I felt I have had to become reasonably techie minded over the years in order to solve the problems I have quite quickly, because it can be frustrating you know, calling in someone and say, you know, the screen reader's not doing this, that and the other. And, and you don't quite know what, why, what's happening. And they definitely don't know because they've never seen a screen reader in their life before, even if they're working IT. So I found that it, it pays to spend a little bit of extra effort just understanding the technology I use a bit more, if that makes sense, to, to be able to do some of my own troubleshooting. Now, look, there's stuff you can, you have to get some help with if it, you know, stuff breaks, but just being able to know how to recover yourself and, and get back on, get back on your feet, technologically speaking, I've, I've found is, is incredibly useful. But accommodations, I don't really, there aren't too many beyond that. As I say, journalism is about kind of thinking, writing, reading, talking. Um, it's, um, it's why I love it. We also have to be very techy too, because yeah. everything's becoming through with technology. Yes, we have to be very techy. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a great opportunity for us for blind people. You know, it does open up stuff to us that we couldn't get before. We couldn't read. I mean, I you know, I grew up and books would come out, and I'd have to get someone to read them to me. Things have improved improved a lot. You know, when I was first a journalist, I used to have to get someone to read the newspapers to me. You know, it'd take hours, hours and hours and hours, and you rely on a friend, and you know, you'd, you'd worry about you know, you know, imposing on them their time and things like that. At least things like that have got a bit better. Right, I agree there. Mm -hmm. How does your current job impact your personal life when you're traveling overseas when you're outside of the UK? Wow, that's a cool question. So my, I have a partner, as I said, Sarah, and my daughter, Lucy. Um, and when I came here to America, I came on my own. Um, I mean, I've been here six and a half years now. And for the first 10 months, I was here working on my own. And then we decided that they would come, and, come out and, and live here too. And my daughter went to uh, the British school here in DC. And she did... They do, they do British qualifications there. The system's slightly different in the UK. So you do these exams at 16 that are quite important. Then you do another set of exams at school when you're 18 before you then go on to university. So she did her first set of exams. So they lived here for two years. My partner, Sarah, because of the visa I'm on, she couldn't work. So she had to be here without working, which was a bit tough on her, you know, doing stuff, but not being out of work. So when um, when my daughter had done the, her first set of exams at 16, we decided that they'd go back to the UK to do the last bit of her schooling, 16 to 18, uh, in preparation for university. So then I was back here on my own for those two. And I've been here since then on my own. So so yeah, so it, it is tough. It puts a lot of strain on, on families. I mean, we go, we see one another a few times a year. We travel back and forth. Uh, Lucy comes out here. She was out here after Christmas for six weeks because she was doing uh, online learning at her university. So it didn't matter where she did that. She had to get, she had to get up pretty early here because the, the East Coast is five hours behind the UK. So her lectures were at 5 a.m. in the morning on the East Coast here. So she didn't like that too much, but it meant she could be with her dad for a little bit longer. But yeah, it's tough. We, we move back and forward. Yeah, it puts strain on things for sure. Can you tell us about some differences between blind or accessibility accommodations in the UK and the US? Do you know, I think I think there's a lot of similarities. I mean, obviously, we talked about Braille and, and people in the UK have the same. Uh, Bra Braille has always been a little bit bigger in, in Europe and the UK than it has been in the US. Although the US, I know, I've noticed really in the last few years is, is much more interested in Braille than it was maybe 20 years, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, Europe was, was always kind of you know keen on Braille displays, whereas you didn't really have Braille displays in the, in the US so much uh, sort of 10 or 15 years ago. But that, that's changing. People use 
um, what you would call a seeing eye dog. In in the UK, they have guide dogs, and and you can get those from 16 years old in the UK. So people use that, those sorts of things as well. <clears throat> what there's a lot more of, I think, in accessibility terms in the UK and and Europe more widely, is transport is a, is a little bit more accessible. So you know, like in London, all the buses talk. You know, they tell you which which stop you're at. They tell you where you are. Uh, you get a bit of that in the in in the US, but not not a lot, to be honest. And and all, and all the uh, what you call the like the New York subway. I think I think the New York subway does talk a bit now, doesn't it? I don't know if it all does, but like the London Underground, everything talks. You know, it tells you which station you're at, what train is coming, when you're standing on the platform. And also, I've noticed here that we have in the UK a lot of in you know road crossings that are much more accessible. So you go up to the the place where you cross the street, you press a button, and it bleeps and tells you to cross. Now you do get some of that. I mean, for example, here in DC, if anyone's described to you the pattern of DC, but effectively it's kind of cross streets, but then with diagonal avenues, big long diagonal avenues like like Pennsylvania Avenue that the White House is on. And some of the big avenues have have sort of accessible crossings, but the ma vast majority of the cross streets here have lights, but no means of of telling as a blind person. And you get more, you, I think you get more of that. It's my impression. I haven't done any kind of survey or anything, but it's my impression, certainly on the, the East Coast and the places I've traveled on the West Coast, that there's there's not so much of that uh, for blind people. And that, and I think that's partly a reflection of the fact that, you know, the car is so much so much of a sort of more dominant thing here in, in the US. In, the, in, in Europe and the UK, public transport is much more um, central to, to people's lives than it is here. We've had a lot of changes in Braille over the past few years, so sure, UEB, yeah, big change. But overall, Braille has been improving. Good. Can you tell us a little bit about your career goals? Wow. Well, I'm 53 now, Jose. So, gee, you know. <laughs> um, so, listen. I mean, it's 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 a real privilege what I'm doing at the moment. Um, you know, this job I do now, people would fight you for it. I promise. So, I'm very lucky in that way. Very, very lucky. Before this, I was what they call the chief political correspondent in London. Again, that's because I, I love politics. That was something I enjoyed enormously. It's it's stressful. It's no doubt stressful, but it's it's very. I found it very very rewarding. So. I'm not sure what's next. I mean, six and a half years in one place is a long time. So I'll probably move on next year at some point. I don't know what to do, what or to do, or where, or even where that might be. Whether it might be back in the UK or somewhere else uh, abroad. But um, I think I've probably got another another couple of jobs in me yet. <laughs> what advice would you give to a young person that wants to become a reporter? I would ask yourself why you want to do it for sure uh, and make sure you know make sure it's it's something you really want to do because it's not even for for sighted people there's a there's a lot of you know a lot of people who want to do this sort of thing and there's a lot of competition for for the places and for the jobs so be sure it is what you want to do uh, I would you know read as much as you can particularly the areas you're interested in if that's current affairs or if that's sport or if that's the environment you know become a bit of an expert you know become a you know 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 the field as as well as you can i would develop as many technical skills as you can so you know the ability to write pretty quickly particularly taking notes you know you can always practice that you know if you sit in front of the tv when they're doing a press conference take take notes and then to see at the end of it did i get everything did i get everything that was important you know could i if someone t said to me now what do they say could i could I tell them what was said, you know, for over that quarter of an hour press conference that you could practice that sort of thing? Key, really key basic skills. I would look around to see what opportunities there might be to do work experience, maybe a local radio station that you can just go in and sit in. And I mean, they're, they're not going to pay you any money, but you might be able to sit around and learn something or a local newspaper um, who, you know, might just let you go in and be there for a week and listen and learn, come up with ideas of your own, see if you can, you know, do some, uh, I mean, you, you guys will know this better than I do but you know do your own you can publish your own stuff now do do an Instagram story on something or other you can definitely do all that kind of thing do a podcast anyone can do a podcast now have a, have an idea for a podcast get some friends together sit around a tape recorder record something make it sound good and interesting stick it up on the on the podcast on a podcast channel I would, there are sort of many many ways that you can get started now without sort of you know without waiting for the call from CNN if you know what I mean <laughs> yeah I can agree that, that, that doesn't have to to be the beginning of it that you can begin in your own way so i think there was a lot of question sure so, any questions from me well, what are your plans what do you want to do find a radio station and actually work as a disc jockey 
Oh, so music's your thing, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, cool. And you must pursue it. And I'm guessing you play, you do the DJing for people's parties, friends' part, birthday parties and stuff like that to get the practice. I've been really working on saving the, saving the money for the equipment that is sure. needed. Sure, so. sure. But, um, but yeah, there's, there'll be plenty of opportunities to, you know, just parties, birthday parties, you know, what do you, what do you have? You have those proms and things like that. You could do yeah, proms. proms, right? Yeah. All those sorts of things for young DJs to, to practice and learn their trade at. So good luck with it. Really. Thanks. Yeah. Probably a dream, man. Thanks. New fly with to learn how to get involved. Hi, it's Jose again. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of the It's My Job podcast. What do you think? Do you like journalism? Would it be fun to have a career as a journalist? Let us know by posting a comment on our Facebook page. You can call us and leave us a voicemail, or you can send us a text message. The phone number is 202-688-5044. Again, that's 202-688-5044. Outside of the United States, you may need to dial plus one or one and your international access code. Be sure to check with your parents first. The email address is askitismyjob at gmail.com. That's A-S-K-I-T-S-M-Y-J-O-B at gmail.com. No spaces and no apostrophe. Are you new to the It's My Job podcast? If so, welcome. We want you to know that you can find us on Facebook. Just search for It Is My Job. Each of our episodes is also on the Perkins Path for Technology blog. Check us out and leave us a comment at perkinslearning.org slash technology. And finally, the It's My Job podcast has a YouTube channel called Ask It Is My Job. If you missed episode number 20, head over to YouTube or Facebook to hear James's interview with Melody to hear all about her career working at AFB. This was episode number 21, but we want to make many more, but we need your help. If you are a student and wants to be an interviewer for a future episode, send us an email at askitismyjob at gmail.com. If you are an adult who is blind or visually impaired and would like to be interviewed, please send us a message via phone, email, or Facebook, and we will get back to you. Once again, our phone number for voicemails and text messages is 202-688-5044. And our email address is askitismyjob at gmail.com. Again, that is A-S-K-I-T-S-M-Y-J-O-B at gmail.com. Newslide reads credits. We have a lot to be thankful for in this episode. Thank you so much to Gary for the time as the interviewee. This interview was facilitated by my teacher, Mrs. Christine Dolly. Thank you, Ms. Dolly, for providing students with meaningful opportunities to experiment with what you always tell us. You don't need sight. You need a vision. Thanks to Perkins Path for Technology Vlog for the vlog hosts. Our music is from purpleplanet.com. We hope this podcast is becoming a great opportunity to learn from each other and learn about all the amazing jobs that are being done by people who are blind or visually impaired.